Welcome to the Oasis of Faith. Let's turn in our Bibles, if you would please, this morning, once again to the book of Romans, chapter 10. And as you're turning there, if you would please say this after me. Say, this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. Today I will be taught the Word of God. I boldly confess. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive, and I will never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. Last week as we, we were closing, we were talking about how we get faith. We saw it in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, and I, I, I told you about the law of how faith comes. And there's only one way, and I want to remind you for the benefit of those that are, are watching for the first time or those that have been here for the first time or, or those that, you know, maybe you've missed a few sessions or whatever. I want to remind you that there's only one way that a believer can get faith, and that is through hearing. Paul said in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, that faith comes by hearing. That's the only way you can get faith. And now here's what's happened over the years because of Ignorance in the pulpit, and how many of you know ignorance begets ignorance? That's right. You hear people pray faith-destroying pray, prayers. Lord, give me more faith. It won't work. That's right. Matter of fact, it'll destroy your faith because when you pray that kind of prayer, it can't be answered. Right. Because in doing so, if God were to answer that prayer, Lord, give me more faith, he would break his own law. Right. And it's a spiritual law. And God's not about to break his own law. Right. right on the other hand, you and I can't break that law either. Right. The only way faith comes, he says, is by hearing. Right. Whether it's negative faith or positive, right. you will get faith by whatever you listen to. Now, I gave you several scriptures. I gave you Mark chapter 4. We looked at it. We're not going to look at it again this morning. But in Mark chapter 4, Jesus said, take heed or be careful what you hear. Why? Because whatever you hear will affect your faith. That's right. Are you with me? Yeah. He goes on and says, whatever you have, if you keep listening to it long enough, if you listen to the wrong things, even the faith that you have will be stripped away. That's right. But if you listen to the right things, the faith you had, he said, more will be given. Right. Well, the disciples, like a lot of unbelieving Christians, or, or should I say it this way, unlearned Christians, his disciples come to him in Luke chapter 17, we looked at it, and they said, Lord, increase our faith. And so basically, as we broke it down, as we looked at it, evidently they thought they didn't have enough faith. So they were asking Jesus to give them more faith. Right. Well, the way, what he did, his response was, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you might say. Right. In other words, if you have faith, like the grain of a mustard seed, which is, represents one of the smallest seeds known to mankind, if you had that much faith, then you would do something with it. What would you do? You would say. Why is it so important to say? Because when you say, you hear. And when you hear, faith comes. So he said to them basically in just simple terms, if you want more faith, take what you have and use what you have, apply it. Isn't that simple? Huh? Huh? Well, how do I apply it? How about speaking? Right. How about saying what the Word says? And yet you, you can get in conversations with Christians who talk about everything but the Word. That's yeah. right. That's right. Yeah. They don't want to talk about the Word. They want to talk about the weather. They want to talk about politics. They want to talk about this. They want to talk about everything that's going on, but they don't want to talk about the Word. Well, whatever you hear, that's what your faith is going to, come from. You're going to have faith for whatever. You, you get around people that talk sickness and disease all the time, guess what? You're going to have faith for sickness and disease. That's right. That's right. Just the way it is. 
You, you talk to people all the time about the economy. Oh, the economy's shot. The economy's this. Come. If that's all you hear, guess what? You're going to have faith for a shot economy. My economy is not affected. Why? I'm not of this world. I'm in this world, but I'm not of the, their economy. I'm of heaven's economy. I've learned how to function and operate in God's system of finances. Not the world's, but God's system. So it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what takes place in the world. It doesn't matter if Wall Street crashes tomorrow. And it's going to crash. And we know it's going to crash. Because it has to. But it doesn't matter. Why? God will take care of me. God will take care of you. If you allow him to. Okay? So, this is where we left off last week. All right? So, back to faith and talking about how we get faith. Faith comes by hearing. Now, you're still in the book of Romans, right? I want you to go to the 12th chapter. Because you hear people make statements like, how come this person has more faith than that person? Well, the reality and the truth of it is this. Are you ready? Nobody has any more faith than anyone else. We all have the same amount of faith. See, well, God must like them because they have more faith than I do. No. No, all they've done is they've learned how to take their faith which is like a muscle, and they've learned how to use it and exercise it and develop it, and then their faith grows. When you were born into this world, all the muscle in your body, all things being equal now, okay? When you were born into this world, all the muscle that your body required was given to you at birth. Yeah, but I see Mr. Universe. I see Mr. Olympia. I see Mr. Whoever. And I see how they're all, you know, they're all cut and they're all this and they're all that. Yeah, they are. But they don't have any more muscle than you. They still have the same amount of muscle that they were, they were born with. All they did was learn how to take the muscle they had and apply it. That's what faith is. It's like a muscle. You take what you have, you learn to use it, you learn to apply it, you learn how to put opposition against it, and then what happens? Faith grows. You got to use it. Am I making sense? But nobody has any more faith than anyone else. Okay? Now, in Romans chapter 12, let me prove it to you from the Word of God. Now, I'm reading for the traditional King James Version. So now, listen, your version might say something different. But be careful because it's very important that you stick with the original text. In Romans chapter 12, verse 3, the Apostle Paul says, For I say through the grace given unto me to every man who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly or wisely. According as God has dealt to every man, what? Okay, the King James says, the measure of faith. So if you have a version, a version of the Bible that says a measure, change it right now. Because he didn't give you a measure, he gave you the measure. Why? Because if he only gave you a measure, then he could give Chris a measure, Ben a measure, me a measure, and you a measure, and those measures wouldn't be the same. Not necessarily. But when he said he gave to us the measure of faith, that means he gave Chris the same measure that he gave Ben that he gave me, that he gave you. We all have the same measure. Why? Because if God gave you more faith than he gave anyone else, he is now playing religious games. He's, he's showing partiality. He's becoming a respecter of person. He's playing favorites. And God doesn't do that. Why? Because he loves us all the same. So he's not, because he loves us all the same, he's not going to give you a measure and then 
over here give you a bigger measure and then over there a smaller measure. He's not going to do that. He's going to give everybody the same, the same way he gives everybody in this world an opportunity to receive Jesus Christ. Now, what you do with that opportunity is on you. He gives everybody in the world the opportunity to learn the Bible. Not only to learn the Bible, but to apply the Bible. So if you don't apply the Bible, don't get mad at the guy who's benefiting from the Bible. Well, I don't know why he's so blessed. I don't know why, you know, you know, this guy, he's got this, he's got that, he's got, and I can't pay my bills. Maybe because this guy's doing what the word says, and you're playing church. Amen. That's right. That's right. You think that might be it? Yeah. it is it possible? It's possible. Yeah. Just a thought. But see, it's easier to blame it on God That's than right. to blame it on. Couldn't be me. Come on. Oh, I, I, I couldn't have done anything wrong. Could be me. Well, let me tell you, in my life as a Christian, oh, I've learned, I've learned a lot of things that I messed up on. And I, and, and, but see, here's the thing about me. Once I learn the right way, I'm changing right now. That's it. I, nobody has to talk me into it. When I found out I'm, in, I'm, I'm, I'm not doing it, I'm changing right now. Why? Because I want God working for me, not against me. Are you with me? So, according to what the Bible says here, the Bible tells us that God has already given you and I faith or the measure of faith that we need. Amen. Say, I have, I have the, measure the measure of faith. What I do with that measure, do with that measure is, up is up to me. If I want it to grow, I, it to grow, I, have, to I have to use the word. If I don't use the word, even what, I have Even what I have will be taken from me. Taken from me. How many have a bank account? I don't know how, how your bank operates, but my bank has a policy. And the policy says I deposit money in the bank. You deposit money in the bank? But I had one account that I, had, I put money in and it just sat there. And it just sat there. I didn't take any money out. I didn't add any money to it. So the bank came out and they notified us, said they were coming out with a new policy. That if you don't put money in or take money out or use that account, they're going to start charging you. Uh -huh. yeah. on, and they're going to start taking money out of that account. That's right. yeah. It's kind of like faith. When that money sits there, Okay, and, it, and, and you don't do anything with it, they're going to start taking away. Well, the same thing applies with your faith. If you've got your measure of faith and you don't do anything with it, eventually it's going to dwindle away. They're going, the world's going to take away what you've got in your account of faith. The world will take it away. So I said, well, before they start taking money out of my account, I went and closed it. And I took my money out. And I put it into another account. You know, I was doing them a favor. They were using my money and loaning it out, and then they want to charge me to hold my money? No, I ought to charge them to hold my money. Amen. So I took it out. That's how faith works. If you don't do something with your faith, Jesus said even what you have will be taken from you. So in this case, because we have the measure of faith, we have to exercise it. We have to do something with it. So you take what you have and you do something with it. And Jesus said, he said in Luke chapter 17, if you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, then you might say. say. Well, isn't saying something doing something? Yes. Yes. So he's trying to get people to use their faith by saying the word of God, by speaking the word of God. Instead of speaking the problem, instead of speaking the issue, Instead of speaking the situation or circumstance, he's trying to get you to speak what the word says. And when you speak what the word says, faith comes. Faith comes. That's a law. That's the only way faith will come. You with me? Okay. So the measure of faith is the measure that God has given to each and every one of us. Because like I said a moment ago, he's not a respecter of person. Amen? So, and I explained to you that faith is like a muscle. Now, Go back to Hebrews chapter 11.
because I want to get into something today, if we have an opportunity, if we get to it, I want to show you something that is so vitally, vitally important for us to understand. I want to go back to Hebrews chapter 11, and I want us to look at verse 1 again. Now, we've gone over this before, and I think we've, we've taught on it clearly, but we're going to be going back and forth throughout this teaching to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1. Because of the revelation that's in that verse, the information that's revealed to us, God wants to see us, you know, and the Bible, how many of you know the Bible is pregnant? The Bible is pregnant. What does that mean? It means the Bible is constantly giving us new revelation. There's new things that are being birthed out of the word of God. Every time you open the Bible, new things are being revealed. There's, there's layers of revelation in the word. Now, for the superficial Bible reader, that's just somebody who reads the Bible once in a while, they're going to get things on the surface. Right. Amen? But for the person, the believer who gets into the word and digs yep. and studies right. and does research, you're going to, see, it's almost like a miner. You know what a miner is, right? Somebody who, who digs in a mine. See, if you're, if, you're, if you're digging for gold, yeah, you may get a few little nuggets here and there on top. Right. And if you're panning in a stream, you might get some dust, you know, coming down. But if you really want to hit the mother load, they call it. Right. That's what they call it. That's the big vein where all the big, you got to dig. Right. See, why? Because God's not just going to throw it out there for anybody and their dog to take advantage of. No, God wants you and I to dig into his word, study his word. Mm -hmm. So as you dig deeper, revelation is going to come. So as we look at Hebrews chapter 11 again, verse 1, we're going to see some more stuff here. Okay, you still with me or did you go home? Yeah. All right, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Paul says, now faith is. And we explain the fact that faith is, where it says faith is, now faith is, yeah. that faith is always what? It's always now. Or what's another term for now? Present tense. Faith is always present tense or now. See, it can't be faith was because if it, if it did, then faith could have been yesterday. That's right. But faith is always now. See, it couldn't be present tense because it would say faith will be. But it didn't say that. It said faith is now. now. So that informs us that faith is always present tense. So if it's not now, if faith is not now, it's not faith. It's not faith. Faith is always present tense. He said, now faith is. Now he's going to give us the definition of faith. The substance. So we talked about substance. The materiality. The tangibility. Something we can hold on to. We found out last week, we're talking from the word of God in Romans chapter 10, where he says, the word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the word of faith, which we preach. So we know then that the word produces faith. Amen. Am I right? Yeah. Okay, so we can actually interchange the word word with faith. Why? Because it's the word of faith which we preach. The gospel is considered the word of faith, because that's what Paul said. The word which we preach is the word of faith. I didn't write it. Paul did. So the word produces faith. So we can actually say this. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Or we could change it to now the word of God yeah. is the substance, Amen. the materiality, the tangibility of things, T-H-I-N-G-S, things we hope for or things hoped for the evidence or the proof of things not seen, okay? What is the word of God? The word of God is the proof or the evidence of things we can't see in the natural. The word of God. In other words, this is what we stand on. Whatever you believe in God for, this is what you stand on until what you're believing God for gets there. Well, what's your evidence or proof? The word of God. The word. I'm standing on the word till what I'm believing God for gets there. Right. Whatever it is, right. this is, this is your evidence right here. This is your proof. Yeah. Okay? But notice he said, it's the evidence 
of things not seen. Underline that in your Bible. In other words, you can't see it yet. Right. You can't see it yet. All right. Now hold your place there and go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. So faith is the evidence of what you can't see. Or the word of God is the evidence of what you can't see. Not with your natural senses, not with your natural eyes. You can't see it with your natural eyes, but the word of God is what you hold on to. That's your evidence or your proof. Did you find 2 Corinthians chapter 4? Now look at verse 18. And look what Paul says here. He says, while we look not at the things which are what? Seen. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are what? Okay, how do you, he, sell, he tells us, don't look at the things which you can see. The things you can see are situations, circumstances, problems, whatever might arise, or something in your life that you want changed. Are you, are you with me? Now, I'm going slow because I want you to get this. He says, don't look at the things that you can see. But look at the things you can't see. Uh I'm I'm making it simple here. Don't look at what you can see, but look at what you can't see. Well, what is it you can't see? Well, I went to the doctor, and the doctor says I have cancer. He said, don't look at that. Well, what do I look at? Look at what you can't see. Well, what is it you can't see? That I'm healed. Well, how do I look at I'm healed when he tells me to look at it, but I can't see it through the eye of faith. Don't look at what is before you. Don't look at the things that are in front of you. See, this is why I don't look at empty seats. I don't do that because I know they're full in the spirit. I told you the story when we first started the church 35 years ago, the man that went to the restroom, when he came back, the place was full. There were angels sitting in every empty chair. I know, there, I know these seats are full by faith. So I don't look at the empty ones. I look at them all as, as Lord. And I have not changed my teaching from back then. The same way I taught then, I'm teaching you right now. Nothing's changed. See, I'm not about to change. Just to accommodate people? Nope. Because I've learned over the years, those that are really hungry and want the truth of the word will be here. And those that don't, they won't. But I know how to fill this place up tomorrow. I know how to fill it up. Start compromising. Start preaching candy-coated messages and cotton candy messages and having all kinds of concerts and and, and, and all that. And we can fill this place up. But I don't want it filled up with mamby pamby sissy fied Christians. I want this place full of people who are serious about God, who want to learn the Word of God, and that you don't have I don't have to babysit. All right. Amen. I want mature believers That's right. that when I can call them up, I can say, Hey, I need you to go to such and pl- such place and minister to this person because I can't do it. Can you go for me? Yeah. I'll go, Pastor. That's what I'm looking for. That's why I'm training you. I want you to be that kind of a believer. Are you with me? Okay. He said, so while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. Why, Paul? For or because the things which are seen, the things you can see, he said they're temporal. Temporal, all temporal means is temporary. I like Brother Hagin's term, what he taught us years ago. Temporal means they are subject to change. Your situations, whatever you're facing right now in your life, it is only temporal. It is subject to change. How do I change it? With faith in the word. That's how you change it. 
That's how, folks, listen to me. That's how I changed my financial situation. Amen. Our financial situation. That's how I changed the ministry situation. Right. Yeah. Right. Financial situation. Yeah. That's how I changed. I changed it with the word and speaking. When you're almost a million dollars in debt. Come on. Say it. Say it. Come on. When you're 970, almost 970,000, almost a million dollars in debt, and you don't know what's going you don't know how to pay it, and you don't know what to do, all I had left was to trust God and trust His word. That was it. The bank wouldn't give me money. They wouldn't even loan me money. You know, it's amazing how banks won't loan you money when you need it, but when you don't need it, they want to give you all you can. Isn't that amazing? And I got alone with God. And I said, Lord, you're going to have to show me. You're going to have to show me. I'm doing everything I know to do in the natural. But you're going to have to show me what to do. And the Lord started showing me, do this, do that. And the one thing I remembered years ago, I remembered Richard Roberts when he took over Oral Roberts University. He took over Oral Roberts Ministry, per se. And... Uh, they were, I don't remember exactly how many millions of dollars they were in debt, but it, they, were, they were quite a bit in debt, 18, 20 million dollars in debt. And uh, the Lord told him, he said, you want to get out of debt? He said, yeah. He said, then give your way out of debt. He said, quit, quit worrying about how much money comes in. When the money comes in, he says, start giving it away. Sowing it into good ground. So I remembered that. And I said, Lord, show me what to do. And then I remembered that. So we started, we were already giving out of the ministry. So, but I started giving more out of the ministry. And we increased it. Like I told you last year, this ministry, we didn't take in $800,000 last year. The ministry, we did not. But we gave away over close to 90, it was over 80,000, close to $90,000. We gave away. Amen. Are you with me? We didn't take in near that. But we gave above it. So we, we gave quite a bit more than, than what we took in as far as giving out of the tithe, giving out of the ministry. Right. So we started giving. We started giving out of the ministry. Her and I started giving more. When I was able, if I got, if I got a paycheck, I took it, we would give. There were, there were times I didn't get a paycheck at all. Then there were times when I did get a paycheck and the Lord said, give it back to the church. Amen. I said, how much? He said, the whole thing. He said, you need you need seed in the ground. And I said, but Lord, i got to pay bills. He said, are you trusting me or not? Wow. I'm not telling you to do that because right now some of you are freaking out. <laughs> I'm not telling you to do that. But in three years and nine months, this church was debt free. Hallelujah! In three years and nine months, her and I were debt free. Debt free, out of debt. God moved us out of the home we were in into a nicer home, Amen. bigger home, Amen. newer home than what we had. Yep. He moved us into it. I was renting it. I, my, my rent payment for a bigger, nicer home was less than a house payment on my old house. The landlord calls me one day. Says, I'm putting the house on the market. This is God. Do you want to buy it? I said, well, sure I want to buy it. I says, but I don't have any credit. There's no way I can buy it. My credit was shot. She goes, well, here's what I'll do. I'm going to send an appraiser out to appraise the house. Me and my husband are retiring. We want to sell the house. They live down the hill. We want to sell the house. We're going to give you first first chances on it. I said, okay. She said, whatever the house appraises at, we will knock off $20,000 off the price. Which it ended up being $21,000 off. So when the appraisal came in, I said, okay, let's see what we can do. We went. We did what we could do. We went to the bank. We told them what happened. They said, sure, we can, we can work with you. I said, okay. Next thing you know, we bought the house. My credit now is higher than it's ever been since I've been a believer. 
The highest you can go on your credit score, you know how high you can go? 850 is the high you, highest you can go. You know what my credit is? 830. Praise God. But see, I don't depend on credit That's right. That's right. because all credit is is a scam. Amen. Credit is just a hook to show you how much you can go in debt. Amen. That's all it is. You know, how many of you know I'm telling the truth? Amen. That's all it is. But just because you got 8, 830 on your credit, don't, that don't mean you have to go and start borrowing. I had a man call me the other day on the phone, or a woman, I don't remember now. They said, they said, would you like to take a loan on your house? I said, no. <laughs> would you like to take, I said, why would I want to take a loan on it? Well, to pay off bills. I said, I don't have any bills. Right. Don't you have any bills to consolidate? No. no. I don't have any bills. But we'd like to loan you some money on your house. I said, how much would you like to loan me? Well, we'd like to loan you $405,000. Uh, but I don't want $405,000. Well, why not? I don't need it. And besides, if I borrowed it, I got to pay it back. Now, if you want to give me $405,000, that's a different story. Another thing I had to learn really, really quick I, when you go through the book of Proverbs, there's a lot of things you learn. And the Bible tells you don't co-sign for people. Well, you don't know how many times I've co-signed for people and got burned. The Bible says don't do it. So now when people ask me, Pastor, can you co-sign? No! <laughs> Why not? Look, read your Bible. That, end of discussion. When I tell people to read the Bible, that's the end of the discussion. Right. Right. <laughs> I don't co-sign for my kids. I ain't co-signing for nobody. I did that in the past. And I got stuck paying the bill. Now, I'm just telling you, this is how faith works. But in three years and nine months, we were debt-free. Debt-free. I'm not trying to, think you, trying to get you to think that I'm Joe Faith. Joe Faith man. No, no, I'm not, I'm not trying to get you to think that. I don't care what you think. But I'm telling you, this is how I did it. I took the faith that I had and started applying it. Amen. Was it work? Yes. Yes, it was work. Yes, guess what? You got to cut the cable TV out. That's right. You got to cut all the eating out out. That's right. Yeah. I, I cut out, I was cutting out everything. I cut, if, if I didn't need it, I cut it out. Amen. I mean, I, I, tr I went as far as I did this for the church. Our average phone bill here at the church, because we had a phone system, phone lines, we had more than we had multiple lines with you know with, and you know throughout the building, and our phone bill, on an average, was nearly three hundred and eighty dollars a month, for the phone bill, because we had phones in different offices and you could hit line one, line two, line three, whatever. Okay. The Lord said, "Get rid of the phone system." I said, why? He said, you don't use it. I said, what do I do? He said, get you a phone. Get you a cell phone. Now, by the way, don't send texts to the church phone because I don't get them. The phone is not set up for texts. It's a cell phone, but it doesn't take texts. And I did that on purpose. Amen. Okay? So the Lord said, go get a cell phone. So I did. <coughs> So I bought a flip phone. I think I paid $29 for it. And I put it on the line. It, and it's, it's a cell phone. But here's the awesome thing about it. If I leave the office now, I have the advantage. I can take the phone with me or I can leave it in the office. And a lot of times I just leave it in the office and wait for people to leave a voicemail and I answer it when I come back. But if I go on vacation or something like that, I take it with me so I don't miss an important call. Amen. Amen. So I went from 380 almost $400 a month, down to $40 a month. Amen. Amen. But there's no games on it. There's no internet on it. Huh? Oh my. Oh my. Huh? There's none, of, there's none of that junk you got on, you know, you, you know what I'm talking about. 
None of, it's just a plain flip phone, or no, it's not a flip phone now, but it was a flip phone with a phone number, and that was it. That's how I, and I started cutting things. And the Lord showed me, get rid of this. You don't need this. Get rid of that. You don't need that. We had two copy machines because when we had our school, is this okay what I'm sharing with you? Okay, I'm trying to help you. We had two copy machines we got from Xerox. And I, maybe I shouldn't have said that. But they were Xerox, brand new. We, had, we, we got one for the church office, and we got one when we had our school. We had one for the school. And those two copiers, they were identical. Xerox does not sell you a copy machine. You have to lease it. Okay? They got you on a lease. They got you hooked. Okay? Well, I let, I let a guy that I knew who worked for Xerox talk me into it. And he got us two machines, brand new machines, and the lease payment on those things, both of them, was over $400 a month. That's $800 a month. Wow. What can you do with $800 a month? Oh. See, now, you, all the, you got to think about this. If you got all these bills in the church... Besides television, rent, and all that. We had television bills. We were $50,000 behind in the TV bill. Wow. Oh, yeah. And when you got all these bills coming in, and they got to be paid, guess who's the last person to get paid? So when I walk around the church and I see air conditioners left on, heaters left on, lights turned off, I want to rip somebody's head off. No, I'm serious. People turning stuff on, lights, and not turn them off when they leave. If that bill, you know, you know how much our electric bill was last month for this church? $2,400. But then I walk into a room that nobody ever uses and the air conditioner's on. That nobody has any business being in that room to begin with. And the air conditioner's on. But they don't care if I get paid or not. They, all they cared about was for the 10 minutes they were in the room. And then didn't turn it off. And it just ran and ran and ran and ran. And I got to pay the bill. Well, you're just cheap. No. No, I'm not cheap. Because I know how to spend. I know how to buy nice things. But I don't want to give my money away. Are you hearing me? Amen. So I, I, whatever the Lord would tell me, I would cut. Cut here, cut there. Next thing you know, everything's, now we got money to pay the bills. We're, we're behind on rent. The landlord, the, the old landlord that we had, he couldn't believe it. He could not believe it. I called them and told them. I said, we got to sit down and talk and discuss. I figured they're going to lower the rent on us. Because I'm, I don't know, close to 100000 behind in rent. That's a lot of money behind. I said, I want to pay this, but I said, you're going to have to work with me. Well, they didn't lower my rent. They raised it. They raised the rent. Three years and nine months later, I'm debt free. He drives up here and he goes, I don't know how you did it. I said, I didn't. God did it. No, he goes, I've never seen anything like this in my life. I said, not only are you paid off, not only are all these bills paid off, I says, the church, we're debt free. Amen. And her and I are debt free. Amen. We didn't do it. God did it through his word. He taught us what to do in his word. Did we have to sacrifice some things? Sure. Sure we did. Sure. But I never complained about it. And do you know what I didn't do? I never said one word to anybody in church. I never said, hey, we got to take up an extra offering. Nope, never did it. Money, the offering went in the basket. We prayed over it. I said, Father, you're going to have to multiply. You're going to have to do whatever. But yet sometimes people tithe and sometimes they don't. That's right. And I can't make people do it. That's right. But you think I'm going to get on the phone and say, hey, how come you didn't tithe this month? Come on. How come you didn't tithe today? How come you, you think I do that? No. no. no? Why? You're not my source. That's right. God is my source. That's right. Oh, in the natural, I want to. I want to call people out on the carpet and say, hey, how come you don't give? How come? You, you get the word. You go to the grocery store and, they, and you, get, you get groceries at the store and they want, they get, they want their money. You come here and get fed and you, you don't even give a, a tip. 
Huh? That's right. No, am I telling the truth? Yeah. I'm not mad. I'm just, I'm just saying, this is how faith works. This is how it works. This is how it works. That's it. That's right. That's right. So now, he says, while we look not at the things. I couldn't, I couldn't afford, listen to me. I couldn't afford to look at the, the way the things were. I couldn't afford to look at the things I could see because all I saw was I was drowning in debt. Amen. I was trying, when we had the school open, when we had the school open and people were bringing their children to school and getting a, an edu, a Christian education and I had to pay. We had 18 employees on staff. We had teachers, custodians. We had office workers just for the school alone and then the kids are coming and the administrator, the principal that I had, she kept bringing new kids in and was giving them free tuition. She was getting her paycheck, I wasn't. She was getting paid, the teachers were getting paid and she wasn't making the parents pay the tuition. Why do you think I shut the school down? It'll be a cold day in hell when I open another school. Christians putting their kids in a Christian school and wouldn't pay the tuition. So we talked to our accountant, our attorney. Thank God for Christian accountants and attorneys. I said, what do we do here? How do we, how, these people, they owe thousands and thousands of dollars of back tuition for school. They said, well, you can do one of two things. You can take them to court and sue them which the Bible says not to do. Or you can forgive the debt and believe God. So we forgave the debt and we believed God. And God honored that. Amen. And three years and nine months later, debt free. Amen. Amen. But I have people now, Pastor, when are you going to open a Christian school? <laughs> when we can get teachers who work for free. Nobody's going to work for free. No. Do you, go, do you work for free on your job? No. no do you? No. no. No, really. Do you go to work for free? No. Do you? No. But pastors have to. Mm. Whoops. Right. Come on. God Thank takes you. care of me. Amen. I never missed a meal. No, no, I never missed a meal. I paid all, we paid all the bills off. God took care of me. That's why I try to tell people now, if you're waiting for somebody to bless you, trust God. Amen. Believe God. Amen. Quit going around in church and tell everybody your financial problems. Say it. Hoping that somebody's going to give you some money. Say it. Say it. Keep your mouth shut right. and believe God. Nobody has to know all your business. That's right. That's right. That's it. Amen. Well, I see brother so-and-so. He looked like he got a little money. Oh, I'm just having some hard times right now. Oh, can you? Oh, I'm telling you. Oh, you know what the Lord told me? No, the Lord didn't tell you to do that. Right. They did it because they felt sorry for you, and you know it. <laughs> right. Come on. Getting quiet in this Presbyterian church. You know how many people called me on the phone during that time and said, Pastor, the Lord told me to bless you with $50,000 to help. You know how many people called me? You know how many people called me and told me that? None. But the whole time, guess who was there? God. His word. See, because well, I don't want people feeling sorry. I only share these things with you now to show you what God brought me through. Yeah. What he brought us out of. Hallelujah. We were over there, but we ain't over there no more. We're over here now. And guess what? I ain't going back. You know what it's like to have your house paid off? No, you know what it's like to have your house paid off and then you go get a loan on it and give the money to the church? I've never asked anybody to ever do that. I never will. But we did it. We did it because we knew God called us to this church. How many of you right now would be willing to do that? Raise your, no, don't raise your hand. <laughs> How many of you would be willing to go to your savings account, your bank account, and give everything you got in the bank account, give it to the ministry? How many of you would be willing to do it? Don't raise your hand. We did. 
Why did you do it? Because God told us to. He said, you need seed in the ground. You need a harvest? Yes, Lord. And now we've got more money in the bank than we had then. We got more now than we had then. Why? We needed a harvest. So God said, take it. And he said, sow it. Plant it. Get it in the ground. So we did. Now, I'm not taking up an offering, so don't, don't worry about it. I'm not, we're not taking up another offering. Amen. I'm just sharing with you what I did, what we did. Okay? Am I making sense? Yes. Okay. We never slacked off on our giving. Not one time ever did we stop, did we slack. Never. So Paul said, why we look not at the things which are seen. So we didn't look at the mess. We didn't look at the, we, we, we didn't look at the, the, the fact that we were drowning in debt. But we looked at what we couldn't see. All, all we couldn't see was, and we saw it with the eye of faith, we looked at what we couldn't see was we were debt free. We kept claiming we're debt free. And now when we're saying it, we're still claiming it. We're debt free. We're debt free. I'm still confessing it now. I'm still confessing I'm debt free. Whether I have debt or whether I don't, I confess I'm debt free. Why? I will never go back into the position I was in before. I will never go back to that ever again. Amen. Never. Mm-hmm. Somebody say never. 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 Well, not, never's a long time, Pastor. Don't ever say that. Mm-hmm. Read my lips. That's right. Never. never. Amen. I will never do that again. That's right. And let me just say this. A lot of the, a lot of the stuff that, I, that, 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 that caused that and created that mess, yeah. it was me. Yeah. I remember during that time, <laughs> The internal, see, see, you don't know a lot of this stuff. The internal revenue service called me because we were behind on our, on our taxes. Church pays taxes? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Don't think they don't. We have payroll taxes and sales tax and things like that. Do you know for every piece of candy we sell in the back, we have to pay sales tax on it? Mm-hmm. That's right. Every piece of candy, every candy, little mint or whatever you buy, we pay sales tax on it. So they called me and they said, uh, well, we were, I think we were about 20 nearly $30,000 $30, behind in taxes. Mm. And they were going to seize the bank account. And so I talked to the man from the IRS. He was very nice, but he was hard. And he said, Pastor, listen to me. He said, I don't care who did what. He said, you owe the taxes. Mm. And I don't care who was doing the taxes who told you this? Who do it? Who's the president and the pastor of the church? I said, me. I'm president of the corporation and pastor of the church. I said, me. He said, the buck stops with you. That's right. He said, you're responsible for it. That's right. If you don't pay, we're coming after you. You're going to jail. He didn't tell me, hey, and I said, well, before I go to jail, can you set me up on a payment plan? He said, yeah. After he set me up on a payment plan, he said, now, Pastor, I know I was hard with you. I said, no. I said, I needed it. I said, because you opened my eyes to some things. Ultimately, for this ministry, I don't care who's on the board of directors. I don't care how many, who's in the church. They're not coming after you. They're coming after me. Ultimately, the buck stops with me. So then I realized I had to make some changes. So I started making those changes. Well, guess what? That was one of the first, first bills we paid off the quickest. Because you think I want our, 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 our accounts attached to the government? No. Pay them what we owe them, get it over with. And then, of course, he knocked down the fees and, the, and all that stuff. He knocked a lot of that off, you know, too. But we still had to pay late fees and stuff. And so, but we paid them off. And that was, a, that was a big bill, but we got it paid off. Yeah. See, these are things. And when the, phone's ring, you, when the phone rings, you don't want to answer it. You don't care who's on the other line. You don't want to answer it. Come on, don't look at me like that because you've done it. You've done it. When they call the house and they want money and you ain't got it, you don't even want to answer the phone. Isn't it amazing? When they call the church, they didn't say, can we talk to Paul McCloney? They said, we'd like to talk to the person in charge of finances of the ministry. Mm-hmm. You're talking to him. We're, we're, we're a debt collector. Mm-hmm. This is what I can do. 
And I didn't turn anybody down. But here was the thing. We paid off every single debt. Every one. We paid them off. That was late, but we paid them off. My toilet went in the tank. But it's okay. I learned something from it. I learned just because now that I do have credit, I don't have to use it. Think it's time to buy a new car? Don't you think it's time to buy a new this, a new this? And this? You know, you can put it. How many credit cards? No credit. The church has no credit cards. No credit cards. Some churches have all kinds of credit cards. We don't have one credit card. Amen. Not one. Not one. Why? We're not going to debt again. Amen. None. Am I making sense? While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are seen. Why? Because the things that I could see, they were temporal. That's right. They were subject to change. Right. And honey, God changed them. That's right. Everything that I could see, all that debt I could see, God changed it. Hallelujah. God changed it. Huh? Hallelujah. He said, but we look at the things which are not seen or eternal. Mm -hmm. Those things that you can't see, they're eternal. So I kept looking to the fact that we were debt free. Didn't know how it was going to come. Didn't know how God was going to do it. I had no idea how God was going to do it. But when I got serious with God and I sat down, I'll, I'll tell you where I was. I'll tell you where I was when I, when I got serious with God. And, I, and, I'm not, and I'm not ashamed to admit it. Carla and Sarah, they were here at the church. She doesn't even know this. This will be the first time she's heard it. Her and Sarah were here at the church working. I went home. I drove home. And I walked through the garage, through the laundry room, into our, our master bedroom. I went into our bathroom. And I sat down on the floor in our bathroom against the wall. I got down on the floor. And I closed the bathroom door. And I said, God, I don't know how you're going to do it. But you got to help me and you got to show me what to do. Amen. And if you'll just show me what to do, step by step, I'll do it. Amen. And I sat there on the floor. I didn't cry. I didn't bawl and squall. I just mustered up as, as much faith as I could. And I said, God, all I'm asking, if you'll just show me, Amen. just show me what to do, I'll do it. I'm, I'm not a knucklehead. I mean, just tell me what to do. I'll do it. And within about two days, within about two days, God said, get rid of the phone. Get rid of this. Cut that out. Call the landlord. Call the TV station. Ask him to set up plans. A week later or so, the Internal Revenue Service called. Next thing you know, I got all these banks calling me, credit cards that are maxed out. I'm not talking 5,000, 10,000. I'm talking 25,000. And I got about six or seven of them, 25,000 maxed out. I'm trying to keep the doors of the church open. And the Lord said, now, you going to rely on plan B? Or are you going to rely on plan A? Right. I said, what's plan A? He said, me. That's right. Plan B is your credit cards. Mm -hmm. I said, I'm going to rely on plan A. He said, then you cut those credit cards up. Mm -hmm. He said, you get them all together and you do plastic surgery. Mm -hmm. And don't you open those accounts ever again. Amen. I get car every, every day in the mail. I got junk in there. Get a credit card with us. Roll your balances over. How can I roll a balance over when I ain't got none? I, I, one bank said, roll it over and we'll give you 4% interest on your... I said, how am I going to roll anything over? I ain't got no credit card now. There's nothing to roll over. But we'll give you 4%. For, for, for how long? Six months and then you're going to make it 25%? Some of you paying 30% on a credit card, if you be honest. 30%, you will never get it paid off. If you're only making the minimum payments, you will never pay it off. I'm on that floor. I get up. I come back to the office. Come back to work. 
And God begins. Yeah, it took a couple of days, but then he showed me. And then a week later, he said, do this. And a week later, he said, do that. And I was just, all I'm doing is praying. All I'm doing is praying. I'm getting before God. And I'm saying, Lord, show me what to do. That's all I said. And now, Father, I want to thank you. I want to thank you each and every day now when I get my prayer. I just want to thank you that I'm debt free. I thank you, Lord, you're showing me how to get rid of every bill. We're paying every bill off, Lord. We're not trying to cheat anybody. We're not, we, we made these arrangements. We're going to pay them. We're not trying to rip anybody off. And then the credit card company would call. And they'll, they said, well, <laughs> you owe $25,000 on this account. Yes? How much can you pay? I said, $50 a month. Do you know how long it's going to take to pay that thing off? You know how long? At $50 a month? They said, well, we're going to work with you. I said, how are you going to do it? We're going to, we're going to eliminate all the interest right now. But we're going to close the account. No problem. Then a few days later, another credit card company did the same thing. Then another one, another one. Another, they all did the same thing. And then after I paid off one account, I took that money from that account and started putting it on the next one. So I put, made this payment and added that one to it. When I got that one paid off, I took these two and added it to this one with a payment with this. And we just went down the line and started paying every bill off. Next thing you know, I'm telling you, it was God. How are you going to pay a million dollars of debt off in three years and nine months? How are you going to do it? He did it. I don't take any credit. Listen to me. I don't take any credit at all. All I did was do what God told me to do. Huh? I heard the Lord and I obeyed him. And obedience, like we learned Wednesday night, is better than sacrifice. That's right. Obedience is better. Just obey God. Right. Why? Because I quit looking at the things that I could see. And I began to look at the things I couldn't see. Amen. And that was being debt free. Amen. Amen. Did you get anything out of that? Yeah. We trust the message has been a blessing to you. The announcer will give you more information how you can obtain an audio or video of the message you've just heard. Remember also that these broadcasts are made possible by the continued free will offerings of you, the viewers, and listeners. Remember also, God loves you, we love you, and Jesus is Lord.